Hello, Hima. Hello, hello. Hello, Hima. Hello, uh, just a second. Uh, hello, Dan, how are you? How are you? Uh, just a second, please. I need to uh, turn off the music. Okay. All right. Um, where are, you, where are you from? Uh, I'm Arya. I'm coming from Jakarta, but I'm in the same school of Himasari in Bandung. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, and there is someone else here. I do not know Himasari, Hanan. Yeah, that's my schoolmate. Ah, your schoolmate. Very nice. Thank yeah. you very much. Um, okay. Now we have someone from Ahmedabad, from India. Yep. Uh, Vatsal, who is very loyal, he always uh, is always present um, at our uh, meetings, these, um, these uh, meetings, and uh, very, very often I, I forget to activate. Now I activate it, so sorry, I have to... Uh, um, anyway, um, from current slide, okay. So what I wanted to say is, the contradiction, the paradox. Richardson was indeed influenced by Romanesque architecture and Romanesque aesthetics, but he was also influenced by Japan. Now, Romanesque is heavy. It is, uh, you know, in architecture, it is heavy. It is, uh, there, there aren't too many details. It's, 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 it's an aesthetics uh, of stone. And, 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 and the Japanese aesthetics, uh, are, are about, uh, you know, the, the very opposite. What is light, what is ephemeral. So you have two uh, dichotomical entities here. On one hand, the power of stone, and on the other hand, uh, the fragility of the uh, floating world uh, woodcuts. I don't see so much really the, the influence of, but maybe here in this, in this particular uh, work because of the roof, but uh, otherwise I don't see such, a, such an incredible influence of the Japanese, um, uh, you know, 
mentality or, or aesthetics in the work of, um, of Richardson. Now a detail uh, from another, he built several uh, um, railroad stations, uh, although built in traditional fashion of stone without steel frame, Richardson well integrated Marshall Field wholesale store in Chicago was very influential in the development of modern approaches to building facades. Yeah, um, again, a very, very powerful uh, building in a, in a Chicago that wanted to, 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 to win the, the competition with New York City, uh, um, you know, long-lived uh, competition. And in the field of architecture, Chicago is, um, continues that, um, that competition. I lived both in New York City and in Chicago, and I, I, could, I could tell that uh, there are differences between the two cities. And one that is very immediately uh, noticeable is that in, in Chicago, there, are, there is no publicity. There, there are no banners and, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, posters and, uh, you know, commercial things <clears throat> affecting the, the, you know, the look of the buildings. The buildings are kept you know, in, uh, as they were conceived by the architect. Anyway, uh, Howard Aka Taylor li Library uh, building in New Orleans constructed uh, at the end of the 19th century. You know, the typical Richardson building. Uh, it, it's an architecture that is informed by, by Europe. And so I, I imagine that there were reasons why, for example, um, Perlacher was, uh, was, uh, had a, an affinity uh, towards the architecture of Richardson, as opposed to, but yeah, both Frank Lloyd Wright and, and, and Sullivan perhaps were a little bit more so-called American than Richardson because of the connect, strong connection between Richardson and, and the Romanesque uh, uh, architecture. A house from 19... Now this is wrong, it's probably 1896, certainly not 1986, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, uh, very, um, you know, uh, solid form of building. Another one in Albany. Uh, mansion from 1900s, which was destroyed. Uh, but this one, I think, was built uh, in in in, uh, in England. Uh, an impressive building, but uh, it, it is. Uh, I mean, you know, I don't think too many professors today can afford such houses. But this was built by a professor, as you can see on the on the postcard. Now, uh, building from Connecticut, 1905, a little bit hard to see, sorry about this uh, image. Um, and the uh, Grace Episcopal Church, uh, Massachusetts, he built several churches. Uh, and uh, you, you can tell, you know, it's, it's, uh, he was a romantic architect. He, he wouldn't mind uh, using, uh, you know, uh, very expressive walls. The masonry is masonry in the case of, of Sullivan, of, uh, of Richardson, sorry. Real masonry, look at it. <laughs> you can get something more, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> masonry like than this one. And I personally, I miss this kind of, uh, you know, uh, tectonics. And, uh, everything became thinner and thinner and thinner and whiter and whiter and whiter and I, I personally miss matter. Even uh, weight, heaviness. Um, because maybe there is some kind of a balance, uh, a paradoxical balance, the heavier the matter, the, the lighter the spirit. And maybe, I mean, I, I know I, I could be contradicted immediately, but and maybe the other way around, you know, the, the, the lighter the matter, the heavier the speed. Anyway, um, so an interesting church, you know, when you think about it, because he, 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 he took, did, did take some liberties here. Um, you can tell he was a rebel. 
Uh, but otherwise, the building is kind of, you know, a tradition of, if we can call it so. But in terms of the, the, the masonry and we, we, with which he climbs even to the roof, is, uh, is uh, rather um, iconoclastic. Another building from Boston, uh, this one, um, you know, uh, house. Uh, I will not insist too much. This was just an introduction somehow to, to Berlache. Um, but I'm, I'm glad I have this presentation. I, I can talk a little bit about him. I'm not an expert in, in, uh, in, uh, in Richardson. I'm not an expert even in Berlache, but I like to honor as much as I can important moments in architecture and to provoke for further, to, to, to incite towards further study and, and discussions and so on. Um, okay, his own house, um, uh, you know, uh, refurbished, uh, maybe refurbished too much a little bit, but um, what can we do? I'm, I'm happy that it was at least preserved and, and, and repaired. So for a man who died at 48, he, 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 he built a lot. Another a monument from Washington, um, but I don't know if I have, uh, uh, this is it, you know, maybe nothing very impressive, but he did it. Uh, architects in the 19th century also um, had an interest, so to speak. Uh, it doesn't sound too right, uh, so to speak, but they, they also built for the dead, you know. Uh, this is very uncommon today. You know? no, no architects built for, for, for the afterlife. But in the 19th century, they did. Uh, another house in Buffalo. Um, another church. And this one somehow, I mean, I, I noticed that in the Netherlands, um, uh, you know, uh, both uh, Berlache and uh, Dudok uh, used uh, very assertive vertical uh, tower, you know, in combination with the horizontal parts of buildings or rather horizontal. And here you also have, the, you know, this, uh, duality in a way. The tower is, is really a tower. Yeah, Dudok was also considered, you know, the father of modern Dutch architecture. Anyway, there are several fathers. It's okay. New York State Asylum, quite a big building, uh, in fact, several buildings with a proposal for an addition, a uh, new entrance uh, that is recent, was recent. So again, for a man who died at 48, he built a lot. And not very insignificant buildings, as you can see. Now, he was a good architect, and I, I think he deserves to be part of the Trinity. And what a Trinity, you know? Uh, Richardson, Sullivan, Wright. Or Wright, Sullivan, Richardson. Or Sullivan, Richardson, Wright. I think Richardson assimilated the best, um, the, the, the European, uh, um, you know, architectural aesthetics and apply them um, accordingly and, uh, in, in North America. A courthouse, this one also, you know, uh, not the smallest building uh, around, not very large, but not very small uh, and uh, still stands quite well. 
he built in stone, you know, uh, so <laughs> the stone is stone. What can you say? Another church. Impressive churches, really. Uh, um, I live for a while in Brooklyn, New York, and I can tell you there are so many churches. In fact, I still don't remember I read correctly, but it seems Brooklyn, New York had 11,000 churches, 11,000 churches, just Brooklyn. Where I lived on the street where I lived, there were four churches, a church in every corner of the, of, of, of the intersection. Can you believe it? So an intersection with four churches, smaller churches, is true, but, but uh, skillfully done. Four churches, four, uh, different, uh, four different denominations in one intersection. I still don't believe I, I read correctly. I'm tempted to think, but even 1,000 is a lot. But no, I think I double checked 11,000 churches in Brooklyn. I, I have to look again for that information because I still don't believe it. But yes, there are many, 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 many churches. And uh, look here, there, there, there. You know, uh, I, I think an European city that would have such a church would be proud of it. And here, you know, maybe this this place is also proud of it. I don't know. By the way, the Netherlands also has uh, great, great, great churches. I, I have a set of eleven books with old um, Dutch architecture. And I discovered incredible uh, churches and uh, yeah, building in, in brick mostly, but also stone and, um, you know, not by famous architects, but great buildings. But I hope Berlache is not mad at us that we allocate so much time to, to <laughs> to H.H. H. Richardson, but we really do it in order to show the connection, a certain connection that exists between uh, him and, and uh, the Ameri North American architect. This is the, the church that uh, we saw before that uh, is on the cover of that book about modern architecture. I personally don't like it, this one so much. It seems too busy for me and almost, uh, I don't know, an eclecticism. Yeah, that, that bothers me. But, uh, you know, once you enter it, you see a, an obvious richness. Now, he, he, he was, he was a, a very important architect, H.H. H. Richardson. So much so that his building also arrived on, on, a, on, a, on a stamp, a 15 cents stamp at one time. I think it's a shame that H.H. H. Richardson is not better known. Uh, I don't think he's uh, inferior to, to Sullivan and, and maybe not even to Wright. Um, it's different. And, but he lived uh, almost half the age of, uh, of Wright when he died. Uh, Wright died at 92, he died at 48. Another house. Very rich. I mean, by, by comparison, Berrache, the father of Dutch architecture, almost uh, seems uh, less productive than um, than, than Sullivan. He built less, actually, than, than, uh, than uh, Richardson, sorry. Now, he even built the New York State Capitol in 1875. So, uh, <laughs> he built some, you know, very, you know, big 
buildings big both in terms of dimension and and significance for for the city they they are in now the, you know the the modernist might say he he is not innovative enough but uh, it, it depends um, I'm rushing a little bit because I, I don't want to eat up the whole time just with um, just with um, uh, Richardson. But again, I think what I said uh, at the beginning is probably to an extent uh, true. Uh, while most architects found inspiration in, in the Renaissance or in the Gothic period, here you have an architect who found inspiration in, in, the, in the period that preceded the Gothic, that is the Romanesque. And not, not too many people did that. Great library, a building in Cambridge. I almost feel he built too much. You know, I have the feeling that this presentation will never end. I don't know. When I made it, I, I didn't realize he was actually so prolific. I imagine he lived. Um, an equally long life like um, Frank Lloyd Wright. He, he would have, uh, you know, covered the whole of the United States and maybe also Europe with his field. And yesterday we talked about Sverre Fenn. Well, you know, if you compare H.H. H. Richardson with Sverre Fenn, let's imagine such a comparison is, is, is possible. Well, you know, I mean, uh, you know, the, 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 the amount of work that Richardson did uh, is, um, you know, overwhelming uh, the production of, of Sverre Fan, and we are talking about a major European architect. But, but the craftsmen Richardson worked with, they do not exist any longer probably. And, you know, so who would work with stone, you know, so extensively today? This is an interesting uh, monument. It's, uh, it's um, you know, it's almost, um, you know, it could, it could also, it could, it could be almost a contemporary building somehow. Um, very abstract, and uh, you know, it does, it does say something about eternity. It's much smaller, of course, than the Egyptian pyramids, but but the ethos seems to be kind of similar the level of an individual effort anyway another house also with a, with the stones uh, gathered informally on, 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 on the walls i'm rushing a little bit because i i i, I, I i'm afraid uh, he will overwhelm berlache a bridge he designed everything so one of the three fathers uh, of um, modern North American architecture deserves the title and railroad, railroad station, several, he built several. We saw that one, we saw this one. We didn't see this one yet. Now another library, God. The church is like a library and the library is like a church. And uh, you know, the, yes, the connection between the book 
and the church or between the library and the church perhaps is one worth talking about. Um, Now look, I mean, if you build just such a building, just one building like this one, and you'll say, I didn't live for nothing, you know, but as you, as you saw, he built many, many buildings. And what buildings, you know, incredible. And he probably worked alone, I'm joking, but you saw him. <laughs> he probably, you know, was the, you know, Mr. Architecture. You know, uh, totally devoted to architecture and uh, and there, you know, I think he built impressively. Okay, Mr. Richardson, allow us to go to Mr. Berlache, please. Ah, you don't want yet <laughs> another house. Um, another railroad station, another church, incredible. Another library. Uh, sometimes he repeats himself a little bit, but Fountain. A house. God. <laughs> he built more than Frank Lloyd Wright. Please, Mr. Richardson, allow us to go to Mr. Berlache, please. This is a famous house there. Anyway, um, there are tours. There is a railroad station. Uh, that's the building in uh, in England that we saw, and I think it was uh, destroyed. Uh, they just have this fragment kept alive. Even as a fragment, it looks interesting. Another house, quite big itself, with a courtyard, which is not very common in the United States. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. Thank you for allowing me to finally start uh, about uh, Berlache. Okay, so now we finally arrived at, uh, at, the, at the Dutch architect we wanted to pay our homage to. As I said, he was not born this week, but he died on the 12th of August, and I, I, I wanted not to forget him, so this is the occasion. He lived longer, you know, he, uh, he died at 78 as opposed to 48, so he lived 30 years more than uh, Richardson. And uh, he does look like a, uh, an interesting man, uh, serious and sensitive and a little bit introverted perhaps, um, or melancholy, uh, melancholic. Uh, in a way, he was more innovative than 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 uh, Richardson, but he also lived in a different time. Uh, he, uh, he lived also in the twentieth century and lived a longer life. And um, yeah, but the way he looks in this photograph, you know, is again a, a, a man who knows something about introversion and about, um, you know, maybe even melancholia. Um, I think he was a, a complex man. And the fact that he influenced architects as uh, different uh, as uh, the School of Amsterdam or uh, New Objectivity or uh, not to speak about the steel uh, <laughs> shows that his uh, repertoire of um, uh, themes uh, and, and, uh, and accomplishments was, was wide. How different was, uh, you know, at that time compared to now when you have offices with some of them with hundreds of workers, you know. And, uh, and you know, at that time, you know, maybe they had a few 
know, people who helped, but, you know, I, I saw pictures with the office of Otto Wagner, you know, he had uh, six or eight people helping him. And this is the man who built all over uh, Vien, uh, Vienna um, with, with small uh, teams, you know, not, not uh, the large, uh, uh, you know, offices that um, now people have, you know. I, I saw Snoheta just in Oslo has about 250 people. Okay, so we saw this. I will not repeat. I have in this presentation a few references to Richardson. We'll go over it quickly. Uh, we saw already these buildings by uh, Richardson. And here is the man, of course, the eccentric H.H. H. Richardson. Um, now, the first building by Berlach, this uh, Villa Hennig and Hag. Uh, with a beautiful uh, um, you know, ceiling. I, I like these ceilings where the structure is apparent, is, is not hidden, you know, what a horror the suspended uh, ceilings of, of the present are compared to, to these, you know. Here you see, I mean, if I am to speculate a little bit, I see uh, a human being building a building and then the higher part of the room and the building, uh, you know, is almost like ascending towards a higher level of being and to some kind of a dialogue with what is above, whatever the name of that above might be. But the flat suspended ceiling, especially in, uh, in um, office buildings today, but not only in office buildings, are so depressingly prosaic. So this is the um, uh, the villa quite, um, you know, uh, a little bit agitating because of, of, well, there are also accessories here that create a little bit of confusion. But you can tell that there is a building in, uh, in some kind of, um, um, you know, uh, not turmoil, but um, it, it has a certain degree of freedom because of the movement of the, of the various parts it is composed of. I saw different kind of pictures, so I, 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 at times I'm even confused. Is it, is it the same building? It's seen from a different angle, but um, uh, anyway, the first Church of Christ scientist in The Hague, um, very different from the churches by Richardson. Sometimes I wonder, I am a modernist myself, I live in the present, but if I compare this church with the churches of H.H. H. Richardson, uh, I, 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 I wonder, is it really a progress? I mean, this, this uh, unending, uh, um, you know, process of uh, simplification, and you see even the tower, that there is no spire really, and, uh, you know, at least here you have a tower, but there are churches being built today that they don't have a tower. Uh, and uh, in a way, they are honestly expressing something that is uh, not requiring a tower. But if I go back to a few images uh, and arrive at H. H. Richardson, we see what a difference, you know, in 15, 150, 100 years, uh, already, you know, our conception of how to build a church change, um, you know, dramatically. I mean, you, you can tell here that, that you know, the, the, the belief, the faith is, is um, becoming more and more um, diluted and pale. This is not meant as a criticism to Berlach at all. In fact, I think he expressed the truth of his time. And um, on the other hand, if he would have built this way in the 19th century, mid 19th century, as Richardson did, uh, or a little bit past mid 19th century would have been, uh, you know, almost outrageous. Another villa from 1913. Well, we are in the in the 20th century, and this building shows it. Uh, it's uh, it's um, you know seen from today, 100. Uh, years later, maybe you would say it's, it's a rather traditional building, but no, no, there are innovations here 
that are uh, easy to, to observe. And uh, I imagine at that time in 1913 was uh, probably almost, uh, <laughs> almost revolutionary. Although it was just 15 years before uh, Le Corbusier built his uh, Villa Savoie. Uh, a lodge from 1916, this is a large building uh, with, a, with a, an impressive uh, <laughs> tower. I mean, it's called a lodge, but um, you know, it's, you wonder, <laughs> you know, um, It's, it's quite a quite a quite a large building, but again, it would be interesting if, if you are tempted by comparative uh, studies in architecture to compare, you know, uh, somehow similar buildings in terms of scale and uh, maybe in terms of other things with the, you know this building, for example, by Berlach uh, with buildings by uh, by um, uh, Richardson. Now a museum in uh, the Hague, this one is more so-called modern. Uh, it's, uh, it's a good building. It's, um, um, it's, it's a complex of buildings. And uh, you know, if it was built now, I would have said this is in China because the Chinese always have, uh, uh, you know, water in the, in the proximity of the buildings very often, and especially in the case of uh, public buildings. But this is a remarkable building, you know. Uh, when was it built? In, uh, it doesn't say, but it, it's about 100 years ago. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, architecture didn't uh, evolve dramatically since then, if we compare what is being built today with what was built then. Uh, he's already modern, you know, so you could say, yeah, this is the architect who also influenced uh, uh, the steel and uh, I don't know about the new objectivists, but maybe them too. Um, very interesting architect, Berlach. Another villa, this one, uh, you know, is more modest. Uh, maybe you can see here a little bit of the influence of Frank Lloyd Wright or maybe not so a little bit. Uh, yeah, the Peace Palace, this was a project, uh, but it was never built and quite large. But even here you can see some of the influence of H.H. H. Richardson. He, I think he admired uh, the United States and he was not the only one, you know, around that time also Adolf Loos uh, expressed his enthusiasm. Uh, and even uh, uh, Le Corbusier, but uh, mainly towards industrial buildings and uh, Mendelssohn as well. A hotel in Hague, uh, it, which exists, is not, uh, is not, uh, it didn't disappear. It's, uh, you know, it's maybe a less glorious building, but uh, inside there are some very interesting things. Like this, it's a beautiful, uh, you know, I can call it, uh, well, it's an atrium. And, and his work with bricks is magnificent, is, uh, is, uh, is just as it should be. You know, um, the Dutch in general know how to work with brick, but Perlach uh, uh, in particular is, is, is a great master. And you'll see in the works of the School of Amsterdam that that, that great tradition of working uh, well with bricks continued. This is a very fine uh, interior. Now, this is probably his most um, known and most celebrated building, uh, quite large, and the interior is, is splendid. Uh, you have monumentality, you have uh, 
you know, the arrival of um, new forms of structure where steel is uh, used, uh, um, you know, uh, adequately. And uh, the, the, this, this, this double aesthetics of brick and, uh, and, and, and steel frames and uh, steel structure create something, um, I think, quite, uh, uh, quite positive. And there are also historicist uh, references, but they are, they are integrated into this uh, whole, which is very convincing. A very fine building. And uh, you can see it is used in the present in uh, you know a sophisticated way from the point of view of technology, uh, and all kinds of things happen there. And as you can see, you can tell from this picture, you know many people photograph it. So it, it is a an important building in the in in Amsterdam. Uh, has various um, parts. It's, it's, it's quite a large, um, a large building. The importance of of this architect in the Netherlands uh, is shown clearly by the fact that the uh, postgraduate uh, school that the Berlake Institute was you know, had its name and maybe if Daliana and Floriana are still here, maybe they can tell us something about, I don't know, about the school because after all the school had its, his name and uh, it's not an accident that in a country flooded almost with, 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 with great names of great architects, that that school had his name and not anyone else's. So. Uh, this also says something about the importance of Berlache for, for Holland, for, for the Netherlands. But his importance is not just for the Netherlands, of course. Quite a romantic way now to, to draw a plan. This one is less romantic. It was not built exactly as he initially conceived it, but anyway, it was built. Now, this one is an impressive building in London. And uh, as I read before, was not far away from uh, that building by Foster. Um, maybe that vicinity is not really so crucially important. This is the building and uh, it's, uh, it's very well crafted and uh, very, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's almost in the new world in the sense that it's, it's not in the United States, it's in Great Britain, but uh, you see uh, in the top left corner, the building by Foster, almost threatening. Um, obviously Foster was not too concerned with context, but the, the, the Holland house, uh, which also has, you know, this, this kind of details that you wouldn't expect in a building that, um, you know, the, we'll see other pictures. Whereas the outside is grayish and kind of, you know, with a rhythmic uh, facade uh, that, that um, is quite modern. But then inside, you have the pleasure of discovering such details. I don't know about the, the, the pavement, it's maybe, I don't know, for, for my taste a little bit too busy, but um, maybe it's just the picture. But I like very much the facade of the building. Uh, it's, it's uh, let me see if I have other pictures. Uh, sorry, uh, you know, like this one. As, um, yeah, it's an excellent building and uh, a little different than what he built in, in, uh, in the Netherlands.
the use of uh, you know ceramics in architecture i think is uh, could be reconsidered i, I think uh, ceramics um, have um, have a lot to offer to architecture but when you when we look at this building we would say this is clearly a, you know a modern building but um, you know, when it was built, uh, was I mean, just look at the building on the right and on the left. This one is distinctly uh, at a higher level of uh, architectural uh, uh, accomplishment and, and, and sophistication. This is an interesting picture because of the shadows, uh, you know, uh, there are reflections, but uh, I don't know exactly how it happened to be like this. Okay, the Swiss Hotel uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, this is uh, a celebrated uh, building in uh, in uh, in Amsterdam. I read, but uh, it's rather commercial, and uh, you know, it's I don't think it's so impressive in terms of its architecture. It was refurbished, as you can tell and uh, it's probably quite comfortable and being a swiss hotel is probably very expensive now this one is uh, an industrial building uh, is uh, oh, this is a school no no i think it's an industrial building i like it uh, if this means anything <laughs> i'm obviously not a critic critics should never use such a uh, Phrases I like it. It's, it's too simple, you know. It's too uh, too heartfelt, almost pathetically so. But it's it's I I I think it's a it's a good building, you know. It is uh, it has rhythm, it has uh, repetition. Uh, it is, but but also has uh, character because of the, uh, the the facades are vibrated and 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 there is. Uh, this fragmentation uh, it has a certain complexity which maybe has to do with the time when it was built i i don't know another building in amsterdam um, but now that i presented simultaneously or well actually not quite simultaneously one after the other richardson and and, uh, and uh, Berlach, I, I continue to see why he was considered to be uh, influenced by richardson the interiors are magnificent you know again i think he's working very well with his uh, um, tall uh, and narrow actually atriums and uh, you know uh, he, he uses again um, bricks uh, quite uh, quite well it's almost i feel here is, is some some kind of a islamic influence almost you know uh, maybe i pushed a little too far my uh, my statement but And uh, I was told today that apparently he built or, or he, he designed uh, two buildings in, uh, in Indonesia. So I think because uh, the Netherlands had colonies, the way influence is coming from the colonies to the Netherlands. So it was a reciprocal uh, movement of uh, influences, you know, the Dutch influence, the colonies and the and the and, and the countries that were colonies also influenced the Dutch, so it it worked in both senses, and it's normal to be like this. Maybe we can make a you know a, a, you know presentation about the influences of uh, you know the colonies of the Netherlands on Netherlands, on 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 on, on the Dutch uh, culture. And maybe not just in architecture. 
because usually we only consider the influence of the colonists on the colonized, but there is also an influence of the colonized on the colonies. There are schools in, uh, in uh, you know, I mentioned Brooklyn. There are schools in Brooklyn, uh, New York, very much influenced by the by the Dutch and very much influenced. I mean, brick brick schools, schools built in brick, very much in the spirit of of, of Berlach. And now now I'm thinking about. In fact, my own daughter studied in such a school, which was across the street from where we live. So I I, I saw I saw it every day. You know. Uh, uh, looking through the window of, of my room. And the presence of the Dutch, of course, in New York was uh, you know, uh, significant. Furniture design. He also has, uh, has uh, very accomplished uh, designs in furniture. Very interesting chair, no? Uh, maybe not very comfortable, especially if you like to you know, uh, uh, if you have some, uh, if you want some, some, some uh, affection for your back, but um, you know, uh, an intriguing uh, chair with three, three, three legs. Of course, there were other chairs with three legs uh, built in the world, but this one is also interesting because of the three elements of the that compose the back. Now, in in complete uh, in a completely unrelated way, I have to tell you that uh, in in, um, in in our you know in in, in our country uh, today is 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 the day when uh, it's commemorated uh, Mary, and uh, I talked with somebody today to launch a competition which I already wrote a text for, two houses for two women in Paris. And I would like to invite you, uh, you, you who are present here at this presentation now. The idea was this, you had Notre Dame, La Cathedrale de Notre Dame, uh, the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris, the one that uh, burned, the roof burned down uh, this year. And uh, to, or was it last year? I even forgot because of the pandemic. Anyway, either last year or, or but I think it was probably last year. Anyway. So you have La Cathedrale de Notre Dame, which, is, which was built for Marie. And I always thought that because there, in front of the Cathedral of Notre Dame, there is point zero, the zero point. All the distances in Paris are measured starting from in front of the cathedral. And I thought there should be another house there, so-called house. Let's say the cathedral is the house for Mary or Marie. Another one for Marianne. Marianne, Marianne or Mariana is the is a name also derived from Mary, for Mar, from Marie. Who was Marianne? Marianne was the woman who symbolized the French Revolution. You probably saw pa uh, pictures of the painting by Delacroix with a woman uh, 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 bare-breasted with carrying a flag. Uh, the, the, the French flag, and behind her, you know, the revolutionaries all uh, singing, and, and anyway, uh, liberté, fraternité, uh, égalité. So I thought here on earth we need, uh, um, you know, divine justice, but we also need human justice. And so I thought it would be a very interesting thing to have in Paris, there at Point Zero, in the center of Paris, to have a building built by Marie, the mother of Jesus, and that building was already built, is La Cathedrale de Notre Dame, but in front of it, and there is a space, maybe a smaller building dedicated to Marianne, to the other Maria, but the, the Maria, the profane Maria, not the sacred Maria. So you have two buildings for two Marys or two Marie. One, the divine one, and the other one, the, 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 the profane one, the one fighting for justice on this earth, liberté, égalité, fraternité, 
and the other one, you know, uh, representing the divine retribution or the divine justice. If you are interested, I can send you the, the, the text that I wrote and we'll, we'll launch the competition soon. Because the man I talked with today, everybody, every female in his family, including his daughter and his mother, they are all named Marie. And I said, let's launch a competition for Marie's and Maria. Anyway, sorry for the digression. This is another interesting piece of furniture. It probably needs some kind of uh, cushions. But uh, in terms of woodwork, is uh, quite convincing, and, uh, and uh, I would trust it, 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 it would not let you down. This is another, you know, this is a chair inspired by, by Egypt, probably by the pharaonic great art of uh, uh, building even pieces of furniture. It's, it's very well done, and, uh, you know, I, I wish I had such a chair. I would contemplate it daily and never get bored of it. Uh, and it looks well just uh, from all sides. And, um, but, but what Berla had did, we do not have uh, great craftsmen. We do not have, and, well, maybe in some parts of the world they might be found, but um, uh, I think they are rare. Well, this one is a little too bourgeois for my taste. This one is also interesting, you know, to combine ropes, you know, in, in, the, in the anatomy of a chair, and he seems to like the idea to have three legs. I always tell the students, design a chair. It's very, very, a very stimulating uh, exercise, and it's even therapeutic. And probably Miss van der Rohe was right. I said this before. It's more difficult sometimes to design a chair well than a skyscraper. But many architects, as you know, design chairs. And you can tell Berlake loves the, the subject matter. Chairs, chairs, even throne-like in a way. Why not? OK, thank you. And now, if you allow me just to, to step a little further. Uh, uh, so we had Richardson, we had Berlake, and I will show now quickly uh, a short presentation on the School of Amsterdam, which Kind of like uh, Richardson is a little bit less known, but it deserves to be known. Because I think if Michael, Michael de Klerk didn't die very young, uh, uh, probably the School of Amsterdam would, would have become even more famous. It is well known, but not as well known as, as probably it deserves. So the, the star of the group was Michael de Klerk. But he died young, at, I think at 40, even younger than uh, Richardson. And uh, he, he, had, he had great talent, and you can see it. He was almost like a boy here in this picture. Well, a little older here. Uh, and uh, yeah, he was, he was the star of, of, the, 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 school of Ar uh, the School of Amsterdam, although there were a few other great architects, part of the same uh, movement. And it's very interesting that it was almost simultaneous with the Deshtil. So you had, you know, two movements that were both inspired, in part at least, by Berlache, but so very different. You know, I mean, you look at this work, and this work still has a connection with the past because of the brickwork, although it is uh, very innovative and uh, sculptural. Uh, look, another um, you know group of buildings by Michel de Klerk, uh, and uh, I I'm more and more tempted to to by the subject of the influence of the colonies on the uh, colonists, because there is a certain exoticism here that is probably a, a result of the of, of such an influence. And of course, because the colonists discovered great architecture in, in, in the colonies. Um, but again, the brickwork is magnificent. Uh, it doesn't matter in the case of Perlache or in the case of uh, the School of Amsterdam. These are the Dutch at their best, I think. Uh, and I, I admire this country for, for the, um, you know, continuous quest for, for something else and uh, for the democratic spirit. 
uh, for their experiments, for their social concerns. And these, these are social housing, you know. They, these are not buildings for the rich. These are buildings for the poor. And now to be poor and, and to, <laughs> to have such a, you know, a spectacular little room here in the corner of the building is uh, it's quite special. Or look at the, you know, the uh, fluctuations and the undulations at, at the top of the building. And this is not the most, you'll see other buildings by, by them, but by, by, by the School of Amsterdam that are quite impressive. He also drew magnificently. Um, um, I mean, I don't know very well uh, about the, the fence in the foreground, but the building is drawn magnificently uh, for competitions or for, you know, seducing uh, the clients. This is also um, a rendering by uh, Michel de Klerk. Another one by him, uh, I, I think he, he was irresistible when, 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 when his perspectives were presented to the, to the clients. I'm sure the clients said, let's go for it. Look at this mask, this urban mask, you know, uh, um, it's, it's incredible, you know. It's, it's mysterious, it's cryptical. It's done in brick. It is whimsical even. You compare the big windows left and right with the very tiny windows on those column-like uh, uh, vertical elements. Very interesting. I think uh, another interesting subject for a possible discussion would be the mask in architecture. To talk about masks. You know, uh, the, the artists in the 20th century were very influenced by the masks of Africa. But in architecture, we don't talk so much about uh, masks, but, but uh, maybe we should. Anyway, uh, by the way of this, I want to invite you Tuesday. Uh, 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 well, I, 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 I want to initiate a, a discussion about uh, what I call architecture and prehistory. Uh, I know it sounds uh, strange, perhaps, but Another subtitle would be the cave revival. And I'll show works of the present that are flirting with some kind of affection for a return to the cave from uh, med architects to Arata Isozaki to Toshi to Studio Gang and to Ishigami, to name just a few. There is a great concern today with the cave. And it seems to me strange that at the peak of our civilization, we are flirting now with a cave. And so I thought we could talk about this. So I would welcome you Tuesday uh, after the Indonesia Day to talk about the cave in architecture today. Not the mask, about the mask we'll talk later. Look at this uh, whimsical and strange and uh, delicious uh, detail too, uh, you know, that capricious uh, uh, turning around um, anyway um, so the school of Amsterdam Michel de Klerk but not only Michel de Klerk there were a few other architects and one of them uh, I should know his name in fact because I presented his work uh, a few months ago um, very good buildings I think this is also by Michel de Klerk but but he didn't work, always work alone. He worked in, in you know in teams with two or three other architects. And uh, you know such buildings do not exist in Rotterdam. Rotterdam has been destroyed uh, at least half of it by the war, but Amsterdam still has them. Piet Kramer, that's the name of the other architect who worked with Michael de Klerk and who built most bridges in Amsterdam. So if you are, arrive in Amsterdam and inevitably you'll, you'll, you'll cross the water on one of these bridges, it's probably made by Piet Kramer. Uh, this great building by Piet Kramer and, and uh, Michael de Klerk, oh, uh, I always loved. It's, it's uh, monumental, it's interesting, it's uh, intriguing. Uh, it has everything. And uh, yeah, this is the school of Amsterdam at its best. There are sculptures, there is narrative, 
uh, and um, it's, it's a good building. Now, this is a park that was built in Amsterdam and uh, Pete Kramer had two or three buildings here. Uh, Michael de Clerc didn't build here. Very interesting park. Some buildings have either deteriorated or one or two burned down, but you can still see a few, like that building, you know, very close somehow to some form of expression is, um, but an interesting work. And again, here you can see somehow the mask. It's almost like a face somehow, of a, you know, uh, some kind of, um, mythological figure is abstracted, but uh, it's interesting, you know. I personally think it's much better than what uh, Venturi did for his mother. Anyway, um, other buildings from this park and built from the same, uh, I mean, they were, they were commissioned, uh, several young architects were commissioned to build on this park. I, I love this this period in in, in Dutch uh, architectonic culture, you know. And I, but I, it's true. I have a liking for expressionism and for a certain type of tectonics. I also like Otto Barning, uh, German architects who a few of them work somehow in a similar way a little bit. But the Dutch are more free. I mean, look at this delicious little. I don't even know what it is. You know, it's a little hot or. But this combination between very, you know, uh, well-crafted uh, masonry uh, in brick and then uh, look at the, the vegetable, uh, you, know, uh, you know, roofing, um, very, very unusual. It's archaic, it's modern, it's uh, even has a little bit of Frangloy right here in the corner, you could say almost very interesting and it's just a little uh, architectonic animal if i can call it so and i don't even know what it is as i said it's a, it's a small building it's a small structure now some architectural details from the because we cannot talk about the school of amsterdam without also talking about details um, Although it was said, and perhaps correctly, that in architecture there are no details, meaning perhaps that, you know, architecture is supposed to work. But I would say not just architecture, you know, any, any good work should have some kind of an uh, harmonious or disharmonic even uh, relationship between its parts and the whole. If Alvaro Siza was right that the window is the most important element in architecture, and Alvaro Siza was talking about Frank Lloyd Wright, who apparently said, you know, architecture wouldn't be so difficult to do unless if, if we didn't have to place windows on walls. Now, if Siza was right, and he did say so in an interview you can find on YouTube, uh, that uh, the window is the most important uh, architectonic element then the School of Amsterdam obviously knew something about windows. I mean, the, the freedom with which they, 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 they invent all kinds of uh, windows and, and the joy in doing so is incredible. But it's not just the window, also the entrances into buildings are events. You know, they, they, they are not in different entrances. It's not just a hole in the wall. You know, like, for example, I hate to say it, um, in the case of the library that Stephen Hall uh, just built in uh, uh, in Queens, you know, which is a very interesting building, but but the entrance is just a hole in the wall. Here, you know, it's an entrance. You know, it's that in betweenness, the interior of the building and the outside of the building, and that in betweenness is important. Another little block of flats um, and uh, excellent brickwork.
bravo to them. Bravo to the Dutch culture for, for, for experimenting in such different ways. And yes, you can, you can tell to an extent the influence of Berlake, although Berlake was not so influenced by exoticism, but the school of Amsterdam was, well, or at least its exuberance um, was, was higher. And look at, I mean, who would think of doing such a window? I mean, such a uh, double window, you know, because you have two windows uh, looking into each other. Uh, you know, it's, it's almost like, a, you know, uh, histoire d'amour between two windows. You know, they look uh, into each other's eyes and whisper uh, love words, perhaps. You know, it's, it's, it's a very whimsical kind of window. I, it's probably unique in the history of architecture. Uh, it has two parts, each window. One is looking away, and then the other part is looking towards its, um, you know, last one, if I am allowed to fantasize. Okay, that's it. So we ended uh, our presentation today, and if you want to talk, we'll gladly talk. Please feel free to, 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 to say whatever you want to say, to make uh, suggestions, uh, comments, criticism, anything. Uh, we are in an informal uh, gathering here. And so. Hello, Dan. Hello. Yes. Did he meet him? Um, that I do not know. I do not know if he met him. He met his architecture, but I don't know if he met oh. him. Why do you ask? Okay. Yeah, I, I, I was wondering if he if face to face with Frank Wright and uh, and learn directly from him or either from his works. Well, um, I, I, th I think he was older in 1911 and I, I, I don't think he was a student of Frank Lloyd Wright now, but um, I, I guess we, we, we could find out about this, um, you know, um, I don't know. But why, why, why is it so important if he met him, you know, directly or not? It could be something, but you, okay, you, you may be right that uh, he was old enough to learn from somebody else. Eh? I read uh, in one book that uh, he mentioned that uh, if jazz is an American architecture, then Prairie West or Red architecture is the American things compared to jazz. Then I was wondering if he met uh, Red directly to learn from the masters. Uh, 